today we're going to take a look at the process of making reads in competitive games. That and more today on Tiny Voices. Have you ever played a game against someone and felt like they had a window into your mind? Like there was just nothing that you could do because they seemed clairvoyant almost. They had such a precise read on you that it felt like Joseph Joestar predicting his opponent's next words. Now maybe it was because you only had one strategy to fall back on, or maybe it was because they picked up on a number of really subtle habits that you have, or because you, without even knowing it, were being trained to react a certain way to a certain situation. When an opponent makes such a hard read on you that goes in their favor, you might be tempted to blame pure luck or say that they were just guessing, but that's ignoring the skill of making a read. And as the level of play in anything competitive increases, so does that uncanny ability to make reads and to train the opponent to react, otherwise known as conditioning. And this process of making reads and conditioning an opponent is not immediately visually obvious. When somebody lands a flashy high damage combo, that's really easy to recognize. When somebody has really impeccable offense or solid defense or really good spacing, some of the subtleties of that might get lost in translation to a viewer, but it's still pretty easily recognizable what is going on. But these mind games involved in making solid reads and studying habits and conditioning opponents is a largely an invisible game within the game. And this skill becomes even more important in offline tournaments where you have more than one set to gather information, often best of threes or best of fives. If you watch tournaments enough, especially of fighting games, which I'm going to focus on pretty heavily in this episode, you'll notice a curious pattern. The first few rounds will sometimes look very even or even favorable for one opponent. And then out of nowhere, like a switch is being flipped, the other player begins to dominate. That's because there's room for error in a tournament setting. There are multiple games to gather information, and not everyone is just falling back on autopilot set play. Early rounds are often used to gather information, to study what your opponent does, how they react to certain situations, and that's how a read is developed and adaptations are made. Storm179, one of the best Hisako players in the world, made a really great post on the Ultra Combo Killer Instinct subforum for Hisako called Developing the Read, where he goes into painstaking detail about his process for testing the waters, observing tendencies of his opponents, and conditioning his opponents because Hisako relies on this skill really heavily, and she has a huge, huge tool set to condition and punish your habits with. He gives some really specific examples of what he does in-game to create a profile of who he is fighting, and I'll just use two of them here. On my first combo opportunity, I will almost always start with a heavy linker after opener. I don't care if it's broken, I just want to see if you're mashing. If you break it, I'll do it again at my next combo opportunity as well, just to see if you're truly reacting to it, or just doing some form of a delayed guess. Depending on how that turns out, I'll modify my combo game accordingly. Reaction Breakers get subjected to less reactable combo strings and more resets. Storm is describing the process of repeatedly testing something out, studying how you react to the situation he lays out, and then laying out the game plan based on what those reactions might be. Again, defensively, does this player go for frame trappy things? If I block a win kick, I'll try to punish. If I get DP'd for it, then the next win kick I block, I will also try to punish. I want to know if you're trying to condition me, or if you just can't help appending DPs to unsafe specials. If my next punish opportunity succeeds, then I know the opponent is seeking to control my response and condition me. He's thinking a few steps ahead in the fight. If I get DP'd in the face again, then this guy is probably just doing things, and I will never attempt to punish another unsafe special and simply let him hang himself. This is also the type of player who's more likely to wake up with things, and my game plan will shift to Oki setups that are not DPable. Again, laying out his process of setting up a situation, observing the response, 
doing this multiple times to confirm that he is the correct read, profiling his opponent based on what he has laid out, and then describing his game plan for the situations that might occur based on the reads that he gets. This adds a fantastic layer of complexity that most people do not even recognize exists. Again, this is largely an invisible game within a game. It's not just about guessing or trying to maximize damage right away with no thought, but taking steps to actually test a hypothesis and profile. It's a layer of strategy that is subtle and difficult to recognize. But there are times when the reads aren't quite as developed. You're just making a raw read based on very general knowledge, which can be very tricky at a high level when you get into the he knows that I know that he knows that I know that he knows territory. It can lead to a player being too inside his own head. For instance, nobody would attempt to throw Daigo Umahara, one of the most prolific Street Fighter players of all time, five times in a row, right? That would be way too predictable. They might throw him two, maybe three times to condition him to jump or to backdash so that they can then open him up. But who would ever try something as silly as throwing him five times in a row? Oh, Phenom, that's who. And that's what happened last year at Canada Cup. Sometimes doing the most straightforward, predictable play is the most unpredictable thing you can do. Before we close this out, I just want to take a quick look at a set of games played between Storm and Nikki at this year's Killer Instinct World Cup. So in game one, Nikki baits several parries out of Storm's Hisako by either neutral jumping or empty jumping. He's trying to condition Storm to not parry, especially on Wake Up since the parry is one of Hisako's only good defensive tools on Wake Up. This is a really common tactic against Hisako players. Nikki does this twice and successfully punishes parries that he has baited out. Storm makes a conscious effort, though, to not be conditioned. While all of this fast-paced action is going on, these two players are thinking about all of these variables. Storm sees that Nikki has only done this twice, and he correctly figures out that this is just an attempt to condition him, which allows him to continue landing parries. There's also a moment where he uses Hisako's combo trait to stagger a hit mid-combo. This creates a guessing game in and of itself. Only mediums and heavies can be staggered like this, and the very long wind-up lets you easily identify which one to break. And again, because the wind-up is so long, you have plenty of time to react. Because of this, Hisako players will often use this as a way of baiting breakers out and counter-breaking them. Nikki makes a hard read that Storm is not going to just counterbreaker him on the very first attempt. So Nikki identifies that this is just information gathering and does not get punished with a counterbreaker. Game two is the first time that Storm actually brings out a counterbreaker in reaction to Nikki's tendency to guess break frequently. But it is not a follow up from a staggered medium or heavy. Nikki goes back to trying to condition Storm unsuccessfully. And at one point, Storm cancels a Shadow Racket into a parry when he sees that the final hit gets Shadow Countered, giving him a full combo punish when the Shadow Racket itself was entirely blocked. This pays off again in the next game. In fact, Game 3 is the payoff for a lot of data that's been gathered. Storm throws what looks like a completely random looking Shadow Racket from full screen after popping Instinct. This is a very safe read that covers a lot of different bases. If Nikki throws a projectile from that distance, Storm blows straight through it and punishes it with the Rekka. If Nikki blocks it and shadow counters at the end of the Rekka, Storm again cancels into a parry for a full combo, just like in game two. And that would honestly explain the instinct pop, because he didn't have the wrath to cancel into a parry without the instinct, so he pops instinct and then does the Shadow Rekka. And the third reason why this is a safe, solid read is if Nikki does nothing after the Shadow Rekka, it tells Storm that Nikki can successfully be conditioned not to do things. Or given that this was game three, it reinforces that Nikki is conditioned. I know I didn't capture all of the nuance of that dominance set by Storm, but I hope after that and the rest of this episode, you've gained a new appreciation for this complex layer of strategy and mind games in competitive games. 
Next week, we're experimenting with breaking down level design by audio cues. That and more next week on Tiny Voices. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take it easy. Have a good one.